Welcome to EPG Patshala. This module is going to be about the poetry of Allen Ginsberg. I am Niladri Chatterjee, Professor, Department of English, University of Kalyani, West Bengal. Before we talk about Allen Ginsberg, we have to remember that he is a part of the beat movement or the beat generation. You may be familiar with the term by now because we have discussed it when we were talking about the history of American literature from 1900 to 1950 and indeed from 1950 to 2000. The beat movement started in America in the 1950s. The most important figures of the beat movement are Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, William S. Burroughs, Gregory Corso, Neil Cassidy, Hal Chase and Peter Orlovsky. Among the most important works of the Beat Generation are On the Road, which is a book, Howl, which is a long poem, Junkie, Naked Lunch, written by William S. Burroughs, which is a novel, and The Subterraneans. Now, Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs' novel, and the hippos were boiled in their tanks, was based upon Lucien Carr's killing of David Kammerer who was obsessed with Carr. Kerouac and Burroughs were also arrested as accessories to the murder as Carr went to them after the incident seeking help. The novel was written in 1948 but was only published much later in 2008. Another account of the same incident was handed over by Ginsberg as his paper in the Columbia University but was told to retract following the scandal of Carr's arrest. The 2013 film Kill Your Darlings by John Crocidas reflects upon this event. One of the most important poems that Ginsberg wrote was Howl. It was first published as a part of the book Howl and Other Poems in 1956. In 1957, Ginsberg won the battle against obscenity when this poem was cleared. Now, as I have told you before, when we were discussing 19th century American poetry, epic free verse form that Ginsberg uses in the poem Howl is directly adapted from Walt Whitman's poetry. So when you read Ginsberg poetry, please keep in mind that he is actually continuing a tradition of American poetry that was started in the 19th century. So therefore, he is drawing on a tradition that is about 100 years old. Some of the lines of Howl are extremely famous. For example, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats, floating across the cities, contemplating jazz, etc., etc. Now, this particular poem, Howl, is of great historic significance because in this poem you are going to find um, various references to important elements in American culture, but not only that, he also draws from various aspects of American life from other cultures. So in Howl, there is a certain epic quality. Now, what do we mean when we talk about epic quality? We mean that a particular work of art, whether it be a painting or whether it be fiction or whether it be a poem, that it should be on a very large scale. And the poem Howl is on a particularly large scale. Moving on. We can therefore, if we keep on moving, uh, we will find that um, Howl, therefore, is a rather important poem because in this poem, Allen Ginsberg represents the dystopic youth of the post-World War McCarthy era. Now, before I continue any further, I should explain what is dystopic. Now, dystopic is the adjective of dystopia. What is dystopia? Dystopia is a term that means a rough translation would be bad place, but that does not mean anything. Dystopia is uh, most usually an imaginary space or an imaginary place 
where everything has gone wrong. So therefore, it is um, a society. A dystopia is a society or a dystopia is a place where all that we hold good has turned bad. So therefore, in a dystopic country or for example, in a dystopic society, you may find that people are killing each other, people are being brutal with each other, people are not respecting one another. So everything that is unhealthy, everything that is cruel, everything that is bad is to be found in a dystopic society. But also, dystopia can also mean lack of hope. It can mean a lack of all soul, lack of um, anything that is wonderful, anything that is beautiful. The, a dystopic society is a very ugly society. And it is this dystopic youth of, of the post-World War McCarthy era that Allen Ginsberg is trying to represent. Now, why is, why is one thinking about the representation of youth um, in Howl as dystopic because Allen Ginsberg is painting a picture of American youth that is disenchanted, that it feels that it is living in a very dark time, that it is living in a very bad time. And remember that this is also happening in the McCarthy era. As I told you in a previous module, a McCarthy era was that period in the 1950s when the Senator Joseph McCarthy actually uh, began to set up um, a, a huge network of informants who informed him as to who were communists in America. So this was a communist witch hunt. So it not only was it a communist witch hunt, it was also a witch hunt against um, all kinds of progressive thinking. Senator Joseph McCarthy was trying to put in place um, a certain deeply patriarchal, oppressive, traditional um, notion of what a society should be like. So everybody who was protesting against it was automatically held as being suspect. Instead of depicting an incandescent image of the country, he chose to take to the streets, painting the world he was surrounded with, poverty, war hysteria, loneliness, depression, regimented speech, by which is meant that there, is, there are strict rules on what you could say, what you could not say, regimented speech, regimented expression, and depicted in the lights of the Harlem slums, the jazz scene in the Queens. Queens, of course, is a borough. That is to say, it is an area of New York, New York City, and the new breed of revolutionary writers who, like the harbingers of any other movement, sought to change the world and its injustices. Ginsburg grew as a representative of all these people. These people became a representative of Ginsburg. So the first part is largely biographical with references to real incidents in Ginsburg's life and in the lives of others he had been witness to. There are numerous references to his varied interests in Eastern religions. Here, I think one has to mention that Ginsberg subsequently came to India. He spent a lot of time in Calcutta. He spent a lot of time in Varanasi. So he was somebody who was very interested in Indian religions. He was very interested in Hinduism. He was interested in Tantra. And he certainly came to um, Calcutta and to Varanasi. And he spent a lot of time in India trying to understand um, Hinduism and certain sections of Hinduism. Then the Moroccan inhabitant Barra's uh, undergoing withdrawal syndromes after ditching cocaine. You've got reference to Lucien Carr's plight as he really charred papers relating to his mental health along with a $20 bill. Jack Kerouac and himself declaring them as the poles of Canada and Patterson. About Philip Lamentia's celestial trip post reading the Holy Quran. Ginsburg certainly talks about what is called the Blake vision following his consumption of Benzedrine, which was a drug. Uh, and this is where I would want you to keep in mind that Ginsburg is also somebody who clearly revered and admired the 18th century British uh, early romantic poet William Blake. And we have a lot of Ginsburg poetry that is very clearly um, a tribute to Blake, or at least a, a, a celebration of Blake. 
In this poetry, in his poem, he also talks explicitly about his homosexual encounters. He champions the sexually extrovert Neil Cassidy, a hero of Denver specializing in stealing cars as well. He speaks about cultural amnesia in the masses, their cynicism at the contemporary period that culminated into paranoia and madness. More specifically, he talks about his mother and Carl Solomon. We are going to discuss Ginsburg's mother slightly later on, but I would want you to also Keep in mind that when Ginsburg is talking about cultural amnesia, what is he talking about? He is therefore talking about the way in which America was perhaps capable of being a much more liberated country, a much more enlightened country, a much more celebratory country where all kinds of differences are celebrated. But what happens in the 1950s under Joseph McCarthy is that there is only one way in which one can be an American and Ginsburg is clearly unhappy about that. So therefore, he is obviously protesting against the way in which a certain kind of American culture is being held as being the only kind of American culture that everybody should follow. Carl Solomon's infamous yet legendary foray into a seminar on Dadaism where he threw potato salad on the walls is, is referred to, sighs about the angel-headed hipsters, a direct relation to Lorca's portrayal of America in Poet in New York where Lorca and as Ginsburg uh, takes after him and his surrealist forays and talks about the painted paint, a sort of poverty-stricken malnutrition bodies that were for sale and, and consumption in the streets of New York metropolis, as Lorca said, with coins in their bellies. Um, who is Lorca? I will have to take a little bit of time out to explain that Lorca is a reference to uh, Federico Garcia Lorca, who was a Spanish poet. He lived in the 20th century. He was killed um, in 1936 uh, by the uh, right-wing troops uh, of General Franco. So Lorca was a Spanish poet and he was a Spanish playwright. Um, he spent some time in America and as a result of that he wrote Poet in New York. So Ginsburg is also referring to Lorca. He takes us through dingy lanes, old houses doubling as cold water flats and the populace he talks about is beat tired and disillusioned with America's idea of progress, writes about the dreams and their subsequent disappointment. Here again, I would want to stress a little bit on the word beat, because beat has got two completely different meanings. One way in which people normally regard the term beat is as a short form of beatific, by which is meant that in a state of bliss, when you have reached spiritual enlightenment, we are in a state of beatitude. But beat can also mean being very, very tired. So you can say, I am beat, by which you mean I'm tired, I'm exhausted. So therefore, there are two different ways in which one can regard the term beat. Champions uh, jazz as a free-flowing art form that doesn't conform to any given structure, much like his own free-flowing pyrotechnic verse in Howl. Remember that we discussed a little bit about jazz music when we were discussing F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. So, Champions also narcotic opiates um, as a gateway to resurrection. So there are certain elements in this poem, Howl, that seem to celebrate um, the sort of the, the consumption of certain uh, the drugs, for example, to create a state out of which poetry can emerge. So therefore, drug use is being talked about almost like a spiritual exercise. Ginsburg called the first part of Howl a lament for the lamb in America with instances of remarkable lamb-like youths. Now remember that in Christian mythology uh, or indeed in, in, Christ, in Christianity, the lamb occupies a very important position. You have the Latin phrase Agnus Dei, which means the Lamb of God. Um, so the Lamb of God, um, therefore, is a symbol of that which is beautiful, that which is wonderful, but also that which is sacrificed. So therefore, when he's talking about a lament for the Lamb in America, what he's really talking about the way in which the youth in America are being sacrificed, sacrificed at the altar of capitalism, sacrificed at the altar of patriotism, sacrificed at the altar of business, sacrificed at the order of, of army, of, of, uh, of making uh, weapons. 
Part 2 is called Moloch. Now, Moloch, this is rather interesting because Ginsberg is referring repeatedly to Moloch. Moloch is an ancient Ammonite god to whom sacrifices of children were offered. So, children were offered to the god as, as a sacrifice. Moloch became the allegory of America that practiced warmongering and thus subsequently celebrated the organized butchery of boys as victory and the unbloomed youth rotting away in the trenches compelled to fight and die for America in her wars. So, you can certainly read Howl as an anti-war poem. You can read Howl as, as a poem of protest against the way in which America was becoming more and more and more militarized. And you can also talk about the way in which the, um, the state, that is to say the, the, the administration of America, was gradually trying to institute uh, an integral relationship between arms manufacturing and business. So that is something which we have to keep in mind. Moloch is normally represented as a demonic bull worshipped by the Canaanites featured in the book of Leviticus. This is from the Old Testament and it bears resemblance to German expressionist filmmaker Fritz Lang's um, epic film Metropolis which Ginsberg annotates as the bull of the Wall Street where he describes the Moloch who has bashed open their skulls and ate up their brains and imagination. So he clearly regards capitalism. He regards capitalism as a very very destructive force. Capitalism has the capacity to destroy the imagination. Capitalism has the capacity to destroy thought. Ginsberg calls the agenda of the Moloch in his poems as a whole boatload of sensitive bullshit and that America's fascination with bourgeois sentiments, values, structures and politics has led the nation to a state of absolution um, and that it requires the rejection of the old to construct the new that is bereft of Moloch's cannibalistic endeavors to silence the voice of the others. Ginsberg reflected upon the characters mentioned in the first part, all subject to sacrifice to the demonic monster Moloch, who protected the bourgeois interests of robot apartment, invisible suburbs, skeleton treasuries, blind capitals, demonic industries, spectral nations, invincible madhouses, granite cocks, monstrous bombs. If you look at the way in which he's using these terms, and if you look at the way in which he's constantly using the exclamation mark, you have to understand that he is not merely reading out these lines. He's crying those uh, lines out. So therefore, remember that the title of the poem is Howl. So all these um, exclamations are howls. These are howls of protest. He's protesting against what America has become. He accuses Moloch of singularly of visions, omens, hallucinations, miracles, ecstasies gone down the American river. So with the advent of the Moloch, it's almost as though America has lost its original vision. America has become this very dark country where it is all about war, it is all about capitalism uh, and America seems to have been completely robbed of its humanity. Ginsberg writes about using the word Moloch as a base repetition like an anaphora. Here the long line is used as a stanza form broken into exclamatory units punctuated by a base repetition Moloch. Now he goes on, I'm not going to read uh, too much from the poem but I'll simply read out a few lines so that you can understand how, how the poem sounds. So if I can just sort of say what is Ginsberg writing? Well, this is what Ginsberg says. He says, Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ash cans and unobtainable dollars, children screaming under the stairways, boys sobbing in armies. Please remember that he's talking about boys sobbing in armies. So therefore, he is very, very anti-war. He hates the fact that there are young boys who are going to fight, old men weeping in the parks. So we've got lonely old men who are crying in public parks. Moloch, Moloch, nightmare of Moloch, Moloch the loveless, mental Moloch, Moloch the heavy judger of men. I'm not going to read any further, but I think you, you get a sense of what Ginsberg is trying to build up. Part 3, Rockland. 
This cynicism in the second part transforms to optimism when Ginsburg talks about Carl Solomon and their time together in the Columbia Presbyterian Psychological Institute, which the former refers to as Rockland. Now, Carl Sol Solomon emerges as an unbent winner, even if he was being subjected to emotional and intellectual tribulations in the confines of the psychiatric hospital. For Ginsburg and Solomon, it somehow became an ideal foundation for their observations of the modern malaise of despair, paranoia and other psychological aberrations that appeared more interesting than the consumerist glossiness of the city outside, although the city was crumbling within. So Ginsburg mocks with homosexual overtones the country that has driven the best minds to despair, to madness. If I can read out a little bit uh, from, from the Lock Rockland section, this is what it sounds like. I'm with you in Rockland, where we hug and kiss the United States under our bedsheets, the United States that coughs all night and won't let us sleep. I'm with you in Rockland, where we wake up electrified out of the coma by our own soul's airplanes roaring over the roof. They've come to drop angelic bombs. The hospital illuminates itself. Imaginary walls collapse. Now, if you look at these lines, please notice that there are no punctuation marks. There are no full stops. There are no commas. There are no exclamation marks. And this, I think, is an attempt on the part of Ginsburg to try to replicate the way in which we talk when we are excited because when we are excited when we are angry we don't talk in a measured orderly careful way we just keep on screaming we just keep on shouting so therefore Ginsburg is trying to replicate yes he's trying to somehow mimic the way in which we talk when we are very very angry so the fact that there are almost no punctuations there are exclamation marks this is a way in which Ginsburg is basically trying to make us understand that this entire poem is just a scream of protest. It is a scream of anger. That is why there are so few punctuation marks. Now, according to Ginsburg, the footnote was an extra variation to the second part of the poem. He singularly chants holy as a mantra to declare and exclaim all subversions mentioned in this poem as holy. It was intended to champion the multiplicity of voices that was being silenced if they did not conform to the conventional. Ginsburg declares, Holy Peter, Holy Alan, Holy Solomon, Holy Lucian, Holy Kerouac, Holy Hunker, Holy Burroughs, Holy Cassidy. If you look at these names, these are the names of people that Al Allen Ginsberg knew very intimately. Peter, for example, refers to Peter Orlovsky, Allen Ginsberg's boyfriend. Um, the Burroughs, for example, refers to William Burroughs. Holy Cassidy refers to Neil Cassidy. So look at the way in which he actually brings the names of his own friends into the poem. Holy the unknown buggered and suffering beggars. Holy the hideous human angels. Now, Howell was first read by Ginsburg in the Sixth Gallery in San Francisco on 7th of October 1955. Howell was subjected to an obscenity trial after it was published in 1956. California State Superior Court Judge Clayton Horn ruled out all obscenity allegations as he declared a work may be deemed obscene only if it intends to deprave or corrupt readers by exciting lascivious thoughts or inciting uh, to immoral actions and there is no obscenity in the work which has redeemed social importance. Howell was first dedicated to Lucien Carr, but on his request the dedication was removed from all further editions. In the original dedication to the anthology Howell and other poems, Ginsburg dedicates it to Kerouac, Burroughs and Cassidy as well. And he refers to their writings as all these books are published in heaven. So this should therefore make you understand that Ginsburg is definitely using terms and ideas from religion, but when he is using these terms and ideas from religion, he is trying to basically create perhaps an utopia. He's saying, you know, he's saying almost as though America, uh, the way America is in the 1950s, is dystopia. It's a very bad place. It's a very cruel place. But 
he almost seems to be saying that the books that are written by Kerouac, by Burroughs, by Cassidy, these books were published in heaven. So therefore the books represent a kind of utopia, which is a very good place where everything that is good happens. Howl was published as a graphic novel for those of you who are interested in 2010. And Howl was also made into a film um, based uh, on the, uh, Ginsburg's reading of the poem. And this happened in 2010. We move on now to the next poem. Um, these, we are only going to concentrate on two poems most importantly because these two poems are regarded as being the most representative poems of Allen Ginsberg. The next one is Kaddish. Now Kaddish is um, supposed to be a Jewish prayer. It is a Jewish prayer that is recited on the death of someone. So Kaddish is a Jewish prayer. Now if you look at, let me read out from the beginning of, of uh, you know, for example, a section of Kaddish. O oh, Russian-faced woman on the grass, your long black hair is crowned with flowers. The mandolin is on your knees. Communist beauty, sit here married in the summer among daisies, promised happiness at hand, holy mother. Now you smile on your love, your world is born anew. Children run naked in the field, spotted with dandelions. They eat in the plum tree grove at the end of the meadow and find a cabin where a white-haired negro teaches the mystery of his rain barrel. Kaddish was a poem which was written for Ginsberg's mother. Uh, and we will, the, when we, once we begin the discussion of the poem, you will realize how beautiful, how moving the tribute is that Ginsberg makes to his mother. So if you move on, we can uh, continue um, reading uh, from Kaddish, but uh, we will continue on to the discussion. So we keep, we keep moving and we come to the discussion on Kaddish. Now over here, Kaddish is also known as Kaddish for Naomi Ginsburg. Now, Naomi Ginsburg was, of course, Ginsburg's mother. She had died. A Kaddish is generally referred to a Jewish prayer song to invoke the Almighty, but it is mostly sung at the death of somebody who is Jewish. Ginsburg started writing the poem in 1957 in the Parisian Beat Hotel, and it was finished in New York in 1959. It was published in 1961 as Kaddish and other poems. Ginsberg sought to adapt the underlying structure of Kaddish as a prayer. And the person he was writing about was his God in many ways. The language couldn't have been different um, if the God was Naomi Ginsberg, who after her initial forays into communism and the Communist Party was suffering from schizophrenia and she was paranoid. She had a persecution complex um, and she was also, but she was also very close to young Alan um, and she complained to the young Alan of her room being bugged by President Roosevelt because of her political ideologies. Um, so clearly uh, towards the end of her life, Naomi Ginsburg had lost touch with reality, but um, Alan Ginsburg never, re never really lost his affection for his mother. The poem also paints a very murky picture of the contemporary American socio-political scenario, and how, um, her, and you know how Ginsburg's mother reacted to it during her diagnosis with mental illness. A Kaddish is also a Judaic way of mourning, as I have already told you, through hymns or chants. Ginsberg mourns not only the physical absence of his mother, but also um, her uninhibited objectivity with which she always wanted to see the world. Ginsberg voices his alienation from the very umbilical tie, not only to, not only to, um, to talk about the cultures and ideologies that he inherited from his mother, but also to talk about the way in which his mother was trying to make sense of the culture and ideologies around her. The poem is written in five parts. After the second part ends, he writes a hymn in praise of Naomi. The fifth part is abundant with the use of onomatopoeia to reflect upon the troubled psyche of Naomi. Now, before I continue any further, let me explain what is onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia is that um, style of writing where you have certain words that almost seems to carry the meaning of that word in the sound of that word. For example, tick-tock 
is a case of onomatopoeia because when you hear the words tick tock you know that these words refer to the sound that is made by a clock that is working so look at this line lord 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 ka 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 lord 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 ka 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 lord so he repeats these words and then through that there is a kind of an effect that he tries to bring out now naomi ginsburg in the last letter to Allen Ginsberg said, The key is in the window. The key is in the sunlight at the window. I have the key. Get married, Alan. Don't take drugs. The key is in the bars, in the sunlight, in the window. Which Ginsberg even quotes in Kaddish, concluding the stanza as, Which is Naomi. Ginsberg, in the original dedication of Kaddish and other poems, uh, the original dedication was for Peter Orlovsky, dedicated to Peter Orlovsky in Paradise. Taste my mouth in your ear. There are other poems of Ginsberg that I think I should mention. A supermarket in California, for example, definitely deserves mention. This was written in Berkeley in 1955 and was published in 1956. This is a poem that is very reflective of Ginsberg's anti-capitalist stance as well as his positioning of, a, of his favorite authors in different places in the consumerist American supermarket. He inquires of Walt Whitman and Federico Garcia Lorca, why were they conforming to convention when they both, like their admirer Ginsburg, were anti-fascist individuals who openly declared and practiced their alternate sexualities. The Fall of America Poems of the Three States, 1965 to 71. This was published in 1973. Ginsburg shared the annual U.S. National Book Award for Poetry in 1974. The anthology was a bouquet of experiences of Ginsburg through travel, music, radio news, broadcasts, and trends. And it, it is considered to be a very optimistic prism through which Ginsburg saw the young America. Most poems of the Fall of America were recorded uh, on a U.R. tape recorder purchased by Ginsburg with Bob Dylan's help. Bob Dylan, who has recently been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Now, we should talk a little bit about Ginsburg's use of drugs, because that is rather important to the way in which Ginsburg's poetry is shaped and the way in which it is formed and it is inspired. So we're going to talk a little bit about mescaline and lysergic acid. Both poems were written in 1959 and echo Ginsburg's growing concern about aging, rotting Ginsburg, who no longer bore the pulsating vibrancy of his younger avatar. In mescaline, he inquires to know after he fully decays what awaited ahead as he was worried, what can I do to heaven by pounding on a typewriter? In lysergic acid, um, Ginsberg follows the same concerns as Mescaline, voicing his paradoxical dilemma. Ginsberg writes initially, I, Alan Ginsberg, a separate consciousness, I who want to be God, and then again declares later in the poem, thank God I am not God, thank God I am not God. So both the poems, for the first time in Ginsberg's work, bore such evidence of self-introspection fueled by drug intake. One would perhaps not be able to complete any discussion of Ginsburg if one does not talk about his activism. He was actively involved in the civil society movement against the war in Vietnam. He was also a part of NAMBLA, which is the North American Man-Boy Love Association. He was a hippie activist and he was an advocate for the demystification of LSD and the legalization of marijuana. He traveled widely, as I have told you before. He was there in Paris in 1957. He was in London in 1965. And of course, as I have mentioned, he was in India. He traveled extensively in India, forming a base in Varanasi and in Kolkata. Allen Ginsberg died. He was suffering from Bell's palsy, uh, and that resulted in the partial paralysis of his face. He died of congestive heart failure at the age of 70 in 1997. One of the last calls he made was to the actor Johnny Depp.
So in conclusion, I would really want to say that Ginsberg's importance in the annals of American poetry cannot be overestimated. He is somebody who changed American poetry, but by doing so, he was doing two things. He was introducing new elements into American poetry. He was introducing a sense of sexual frankness. He was introducing a sense of overt political um, uh, position taking but in doing that he was also continuing uh, a certain style of poetry or, or a format of poetry which we are already familiar with from our reading of Walt Whitman. So he was drawing from a certain American tradition from the previous century but he was also reinventing it. He was using the format to talk about new things, things which could not be said before because he believed that Walt Whitman and uh, the Spanish poet uh, Federico Garcia Lorca could perhaps have been more um, effective as poets if they had not uh, couched their poetry in a certain kind of caution. Ginsberg did not believe in caution. He believed in taking risk. He believed in confronting danger, which is why now that we read Ginsberg's poems, we see the celebration of, of a challenge thrown to the face of conservative traditional society. Thank you.